In this, the sixth lesson of the Henry George School of Social Sciences course, Understanding Our Political Economy, we return to an analysis of the distinction between the laws of production and distribution embraced by a political economy and the price mechanism theory offered by neoclassical economics. The focus of the economist's research and writing was far different than that of his predecessor and even his contemporary political economist. An important theoretical question economists wanted to explore was whether price clears all markets. The focus of the economist's research and writing was far different than that of his predecessor political economist. An important theoretical question economists wanted to explore was whether price clears all markets. This graphical illustration of how price clears markets conveys the assertion that those who supply a good or service and those who demand a good or service will agree on a price for a given quantity. Where the supply and demand curves intersect is the point of equilibrium. An expansion of these relationships to the larger economy is the basis for general equilibrium analysis. Many of the European train economists embraced a simplified neoclassical theory of markets, asserting that price serves as a market clearing function for all factors of production and that markets always return to general equilibrium, where price is high enough to satisfy those who bring supply to market and low enough to satisfy those willing to pay for any good or service. Neoclassical theory accurately describes labor market dynamics because labor in the aggregate and as a factor of production is quite sensitive to changes in the price offered in return for labor. Moreover, most people must continue to offer their services in exchange for compensation even as the wages they are offered are being forced down by market conditions or by the introduction of laws that prevent labor from engaging in collective bargaining. The same is true for the markets for capital goods, which are also sensitive to the price mechanism. Equipment, tools, and buildings all depreciate over time and suffer loss in functional utility as well as in exchange value. Thus, capital goods require a continuous infusion of labor and new capital goods to maintain both use value and exchange value. Now, what about credit markets? The demand or and supply of credit is also quite sensitive to the price mechanism. Deregulation of credit markets expanded access to credit and competition among credit providers at least initially. Credit is normally competitively priced for risk, provided the actual risk is analyzed and disclosed to lenders and investors, or when other, generally political, considerations are not involved. An unforeseen consequence of financial deregulation has been a dramatic consolidation of the banking sector. Credit markets are also subjected to considerable amount of fraud and predatory lending practices. Those with the least understanding of financial matters are at great risk of being taken advantage of. Unfulfilled is the need for greater financial literacy in response to the complexity of newer financial instruments. Where neoclassical economic theory fails, and fails miserably, is with its attempted application of the price mechanism to land markets. This is arguably the reason why the first generation of economists were compelled to remove land as a distinct factor of production. What economists could not explain away is that the supply of land is perfectly inelastic, which means the supply is inherently insensitive to changes in price. Rising land prices signal landowners to hold land for even higher price gains. One of the early leading teachers of the new economics, Frank Knight, attempted to justify the merger of land with capital goods for purposes of analysis. In 1956, he wrote the following. Land is capital merely. 
Defined in any realistic way, it presents an infinite variety of conditions as to maintenance and replacement requirements and possibilities of increase in supply, as does any other general class of capital instruments. As we have explained, land, which in political economy means all of nature, has a zero production cost in terms of labor and capital goods. Its supply is fixed, although the potential usefulness of land can change over time as a result of natural processes and technological advances. However, it must be acknowledged that there is a degree of substitution possible between locations that have relatively similar advantages. This makes it seem to most of us that the supply of land is actually elastic and therefore responsive to changes in the market price being offered. The argument would be stronger if the land and natural resources of the United States and virtually every other country was more widely owned. Getting back to the economics of land markets and the problem with the neoclassical assertion that price clears land markets in the same way price clears markets for labor, capital goods, and credit, what follows is a graphical look at what makes land markets so different. Now let's take a look at the supply of land that is actually available to be brought into production. In this graph, the total supply of land in a region, without regard to topographical or other natural characteristics, or to the degree of societal organization, is indicated by the curve labeled S1. In our world, not all the land area of any region is available for development. A portion cannot, at least with the current technologies available, be productively utilized for reasons of topography, being subject to frequent flooding, potential for earthquakes, etc. The quantity lost to the total supply is reflected by the distance between supply curves S1 and S2. Then there are lands a community allocates for parks, recreation, animal preserves, wetlands, etc. In our hypothetical example, the amount of land removed from developable supply is the difference between S1 and S3. Every community also allocates locations in the community for governmental buildings and other public purposes, airports, highways, railway lines, and other public agency uses. Adding this amount of land to the total removed from supply brings us down to the supply curve S4. Thus, only half of the total supply of land is available for private development, for purchase and sale, or for lease under market conditions. Now, at that point, a somewhat strange-looking supply curve, S5, appears. The curve is leaning to the left which is an indication that even as the price for locations is rising, the quantity of land potentially available for development is falling. The reason is that the expectation of even higher prices is an incentive for owners of land to withdraw their land holding from the market. On the general subject of speculation, Frank Knight expresses the widely taught view by economics professors that all markets are speculative and, in fact, approach the character of an ideal market more or less in proportion to the degree that they are explicitly and effectively speculative, that is, to the degree in which there is organized speculation. The problem with Knight's analysis is that he does not consider the societal consequences of hoarding nature for speculative gain. The one market where speculation does not affect the general population is the market for collectibles, such as artwork or antiques or classic automobiles. No less an authority on the principles of taxation than Adam Smith recognized that the ideal source of revenue with which to pay for public goods and services is, as he wrote, quote, the ordinary rent of land. It took Henry George to come to a complete understanding of the synergy that would occur if governments would change the way they chose to raise revenue. 
Throughout the United States and in the towns and cities of many other countries, the taxation of real estate generates a significant portion of the funding required to pay for public goods and services. In the United States, this includes not only city government, but county, borough, and township governments, as well as public school districts. Real estate consists of the land parcel owned and whatever building exists on the land. In most U.S. taxing jurisdictions, separate values are assigned by assessors to the land and to the building. The principles of political economy dictate that the optimum amount of revenue to be derived from the taxation of real estate is the potential annual rental value of whatever location is held. Buildings are depreciating assets that require continuous expenditure of labor and capital goods to maintain their condition. Eventually, major building systems wear out and must be entirely replaced. The conventional property tax essentially penalizes owners for taking care of their buildings. On any street in any town or city, the value of locations varies based on what is called highest best use. On this street pictured here, highest best use is residential. The principles of political economy call for the elimination of taxation of all buildings. Those lots on this street that have the same street frontage and depth will have the same potential annual rental value, the value that should be collected via property taxation. The building owners are rewarded for keeping their buildings maintained. The owner of the vacant lot would have a financial incentive to bring the lot to its highest best use or sell to someone who would. Despite the fact that economists generally ignored the connection between periodic cycles of boom to bust and the operation of property markets, there has always been a moderate recognition that a high effective rate of taxation on location rental values was theoretically beneficial, if difficult, to implement politically. One professor of economics who quietly promoted this reform was C. Lowell Harris who taught for many years at Columbia University. In a lecture delivered in 1970, Harris stated, Heavy taxation of new buildings must stand as a tragically apt example of mankind creating needless obstacles for itself. Cities, which urgently need to replace obsolete, decayed, degrading buildings, nevertheless put powerful tax impediments in the way of progress. At present, an owner can keep a resource, land, created by nature, plus governmental outlays for community facilities, from being used or used to best advantage. The higher land tax would reduce such possibilities. It is also worth noting that as the effective rate of taxation on location rental values increases, the selling price of land parcels will fall. Theoretically, a 100% tax on rental value will bring the price of land parcels down to zero. Thus, at some point, the community must begin to rely on location rental values and discard selling prices as the basis for determining a property owner's annual tax obligation. As an interim measure, communities may also consider adopting circuit breakers to lessen displacement of long-term residents living on fixed incomes, but without imposing an undue burden on other property owners. Under this type of program, the property owner would be required to make an annual payment based on household income and an affordability formula. The amount owed that is not paid would accrue as a lien on the property, possibly subject to an interest charge. The total accrued amount of unpaid property taxes would be paid to the community at the time the property is sold or when transferred to heirs. Looking at our economic and social history, we conclude that what has long been called, quote, the tragedy of the commons is our failure to publicly capture the rental value of our lands. I close this lesson with observations from two economic professors who throughout their entire academic careers have supported the full taxation of land's rental value. Nicholas Tiedemann at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and Mason Gaffney 
at the University of California, Riverside. Professor Tiedemann has observed, when taxes are removed from labor and capital and placed on land, people work more and save more. Such a shift in the structure of public finance also reduces the extent to which people speculate in land, which brings more land into production. Mason Gaffney adds, Most taxes other than the site value tax are synchronized with the taxpayer's liquidity. The site value tax is not so designed, either in philosophy or application. It is in vain to criticize it because it is inconvenient for some landowners to raise the cash to pay for it. It is not supposed to convenience such landowners. On the contrary, its philosophy is that the landowner owes society something for the privilege of holding a piece of the limited surface of this small planet and an annual required cash payment is calculated to inconvenience him into using his land so as to render service to others and offer employment to others, many of whom may not own land. Speculation in the markets for financial instruments is another area where the consequences of risk-taking are sometimes imposed on the general population. The analyses of economists such as Nicholas Tiedemann and Mason Gaffney show that the volatile character of credit-fueled, speculation-driven land markets is carried over into the markets for financial instruments. In this age of global interconnected financial markets, the portion of available financial reserves allocated to market speculation is huge. In this way, financial speculation draws funds away from the investment in capital goods production and real economic growth. Rational public policy, and tax policy in particular, should be designed to reverse the financial rewards in the direction of capital goods. This, quote, the single tax, would accomplish if the political will could be generated to bring about this systemic reform. Absent the single tax, the public policy challenge is to at least move in the right direction. We've reached the end of lesson six.